continuing in our series destinations destinations and to sort of introduce today's topic um, looking ahead we've all dug ourselves out of trouble haven't we haven't there been times in our lives when we dug ourselves into a giant pit we look around and we go oh man i can't believe we're here I've counseled with so many people who they themselves dug the hole that they're in. And we've all been there. They created that set of circumstances by their own hands. Uh, Usually they dug themselves into a relational hole or financial hole. Those seem to be the two most common pits that people find themselves in. It could be too much debt. could be a bad marriage. It could be you got entangled with somebody you wish you had never met in your life. Have you ever been known one of, you know, right? We all can identify with that. It could be alcohol. It could be that partnership that we wish we would have just never even met that company. We wish we would have never answered that wanted ad. And here's the question that I usually ask, and I have to be honest with you, I kind of ask this for my own personal benefit. I want to kind of know this and I'm curious. And I usually say, was there a warning somewhere along the way? Did somebody like pull you aside and say, you got to watch out here? Did somebody, did did you see some warning sign down the road that you were going down? Did you see something that caused you to say, whoa, what about that? Wait a minute. And you know nine times out of ten what the answer is? Yes. Yes. Nine times out of ten, the answer was somebody did warn me. I did see a sign on the road, you know, that I was going down. I did see that. Suddenly, life gets complicated. Life gets complicated. It, it, it's, we, we figured it would work out, but it just didn't. It ended up exactly where we did not want to be. We ignored the warning signs. We just kept going ahead. And we look around and life gets so much harder. Suddenly it's complicated. If life wasn't complicated enough, we did this, right? We go, how were we so dumb? Why couldn't we see the signs. Why didn't we pay attention to the signs? I did see them, but why didn't I pay attention? How could I have been so blind? Or, or the worst one. How could I have been so stubborn, right? How could I have been so stubborn just to keep going down that road? What I want to talk about today is how to keep this from ever happening in your life again. Is there a way to keep this from ever happening? What if there was a way? And what if you could apply a piece of scripture, a piece of wisdom to your, to your life, and that never had to take place again? You never found yourself in one of those giant holes by your own making. Maybe some circumstances happen and you can't control them and you have to dig yourself out a little bit, but, but never by your own hand again. Well, last week we said that every single path we take has a a destination, doesn't it? That's the series we're in. It has a destination. And our decisions 
are like steps down a path. They're like steps down a road that we take, driving down a road. There are financial paths that, we all, that, that have predetermined destinations, there's, 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 there's spiritual paths that end up somewhere specific. There's, a re, there's relational decisions that we make or relational roads or paths that we get on that have destinations attached to them. And, and direction, not intention. Direction, not motivation, determines our destination, doesn't it? We might think, well, you know, we intended to go down that other road. We intended to be at a whole different place, but <sighs> intentions didn't matter, did it? it we, we wanted to be somewhere else, but we just didn't end up there. That doesn't matter because there's often a disconnect between where we wanted to end up and the path we set out on. We want to go one way, but the decisions we make put us on a different past path headed to a different destination. It is not where we are that's the issue. It's not where we are that's the issue. It's where we're headed that is the issue. So we ended up last week with this question. We ended last week with a question. If you continue on your current course... Where will you end up? If you continue on the current course financially, where are you going to end up? If you, if, if you continue on the current course in that relationship, where are you going to end up? If you stay on the current path that you're on spiritually, where is that going to get you? Where are you going to end up? Sometimes things cross our paths and they distract us. Sometimes things come up and it catches our attention, right? It seems so promising. That path seemed like the shortest distance to the place we wanted to get to. It was a shortcut. We knew it was dangerous. We knew we could get caught. We knew there was a warning sign. Somebody, mama shared with us, son, you shouldn't do that. I want to teach us a, a verse today that can really speak deeply into our life. A verse that can, from, from Proverbs, and I say a verse because that's all it is today. One little tiny verse from the Bible, but it has filled. Don't let the size misguide you. It doesn't take a lot of scripture sometimes to get our attention and help us. One verse can make a tremendous difference. And one verse, I think, if you will heed this, if you will put this into your life, if you will memorize it, and you will live by this one verse, I think in the future it can help keep you out of those pits by your own hand. You may have to dig your way out of the one you're in, uh, but going forward you won't be digging another one. You won't be going any deeper in the one that you're in. And, and here's the verse, written by perhaps the wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Here's the verse, Proverbs 27:12. The prudent see danger and take refuge. If you have your Bibles, you might want to just mark that. It's in your sermon notes. You could just circle that. But the simple keep going and they suffer for it. The King James helps us in, in this verse. Uh, the King James says it this way. A prudent man foreseeth. Boy, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Foreseeth. Just maybe in your sermon notes, circle that. They foresee this evil and they hide themselves. They Hideth. We'll use the King James word. They hideth themselves. But the simple pass on and are punished. Punished. And that is speaking about always. This is like always happening. And the word picture is these people are going down a path. They're going down a path and the wise man, he sees trouble coming. And it's coming, it's approaching him, whether he's walking closer to it or the, the trouble's coming, you know, sometimes trouble just finds you, right, in life. And he sees the trouble coming, and, and this guy ducks out of the way and just watches it pass by and then gets back on the path. Maybe it causes a slight delay in his life, but it's worth it. And he just gets back on the path and keeps going, right? But the simple man, the simple, the naive guy, the guy that isn't so wise, 
The foolish man might be another word for that. The simple keep going. They see it, they keep going, and they always, always, always suffer harm. You see, in this proverb, there's two kinds of people. There's two kinds of people. There are two separate responses. There are two completely different outcomes. Both people are facing the exact same situations. Both people have in common, they are both having the same warning signs. They see the same evil. And on their paths, both paths hinted at danger. The prudent, the wise man, the person, this person evaluates. He, he looks ahead. That's why we have a looking glass. He looks ahead down the path. And he looks as far down as he can. He, he's not a prophet. He can just connect the dots. He sees the future. He knows that these paths are, are connected. These events are not isolated incidents. He, he evaluates everything within the context of the future. In light of my future hopes, in light of my future dreams, what is the wise thing to do? In light of everything I know and everything I can anticipate, what is the prudent thing to do? In the larger context of life, what is the path I should take? Should I keep going or should I get off the next on off ramp and should I do a circle about and, and maybe go a different direction? The person knows that one thing leads to another. There's a cause and effect relationship in life. There are no isolated events. He knows this wise man knows there's no isolated relationships that life is connected. But the simple, the naive they see life a little bit different. They see life as disconnected, isolated events that really have no bearing on one another. No broader context than me in the present moment, at the present time. i got to live life to the fullest today because who knows about tomorrow? i got to live in the moment. It'll work out. It's all about now. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? Are you kidding me? Only today for me. Now the prudent see danger looming down the path. They look for it, maybe. Maybe you say they're a little pessimistic, but they can see it because they're connecting the dots, not because they have some special insight, but they're just simply paying attention. They respond appropriately to what they see, and they move out of the way, or they take refuge, or they just prepare themselves in advance. The simple see danger and they don't recognize it or worse, they just ignore the warnings. No one would admit to being naive. You probably know many people. They would, won't admit to being naive. But when there is trouble brewing and you do nothing or worse, you see the warning signs and you just keep plunging ahead regardless that's naive at best, and we're being charitable with that. That's foolish at worst. The simple are like the man on the raft, and they can hear the rapids ahead. They can see the sign. I've done whitewater rafting, and it's spectacular. It's such a thrill, but I've never done it alone because I want somebody that's been down that river before. And they can see the scout signs and all the excitement. Then they read, Scout Rapids. You better have a scout to go down these rapids. Scout Rapids, pay attention, take warning, uh, grab hold, you know, make sure the life jacket is secure. It's like a man who sees all those signs. And, oh, the water's calm here. What do I need to do that for? We have plenty of time. And here's what the Bible says. They always, always, always suffer harm. Why? Because there are issues that an individual cannot deal successfully with once you pass a certain point. There becomes a, a point of no return in every person's life where finally you wake up one morning after you've ignored the warning signs, you've been living for the day too long, and you wake up and you go, 
there's no good option left. I thought I had plenty of time. There are situations that if left unattended, life gets so much more complicated. There are no good options left. You wake up one morning and you realize, I'm 60 years old. I better start saving. That's probably not the time to start that, is it? You wake up and you, you go in and you take a pregnancy test and that is not the moment to reevaluate the relationship. Addiction. There is never a good option when it comes to addictions. They're all complicated They're all going to cost you some time in your life. You're involved with Him and you know you shouldn't be. Eventually, you're going to have to lie about that relationship to somebody. That's going to make life so much more complicated. With regards to relationships, the principle, as we're talking about relationships, the principle is never to evaluate a relationship based on where it is. You always, and this is in your notes, you always want to evaluate a relationship based on where that relationship is going, where that relationship is headed. Relationships are dynamic. They never, ever, ever stay in one place. They're either growing healthier or unhealthier. They're either growing or they're dying. Relationships are never static. If you started in a relationship at point A and you move and you go to point B in that relationship, you have a good idea of where that relationship is tracking. And you probably can figure out what's coming if you get really honest with yourself. And that's the key, isn't it? That's the key, isn't it? To get honest with yourself, to be honest with yourself. If you're not honest with yourself, you're lying to perhaps the most important person in your life. That can cost you a lot. The prudent person doesn't respond to where the relationship is. They respond to where that relationship is headed. If you're in a marriage and your partner is saying, your marriage, your your husband, your wife is saying, honey, I think we need to get some counseling. Or honey, (laughs) this is maybe even worse, you need to get some counseling, right? No elbows, please. Just keep them to yourself. You need to get some counseling, right? You need to heed that. You need to do something. To wait is to risk passing the point where all the options in your marriage are bad. Which attorney are you going to use? Who wants to answer that question? Where are the kids going to to sleep at night? Who wants to answer that question when all the options are bad? If you're married and you start to enjoy that company of that special someone of the opposite sex at work, Can you just honestly answer the question, where is that relationship headed? Pastor, you're being so off the charts. No, I'm not. I hear this all the time. Where do you think that relationship might be headed? Do something. Do you really need to pray about that? I think you need to act. I think you need to cut that off. If you're single and you're that married guy, that married gal is coming on to you and you like it, Where is that relationship headed? Do something about it. Your children's friends, your dating relationship, your partnership at work, money. You realize that debt is not an event. Debt is a path. Debt is a path that leads to bondage. It leads to financial slavery. When all you're working for, all your options are limited, you can't go on the vacation you want, you can't go on the cool mission trip to go help some people It may be hit by a hurricane or somebody, you can't, you can't take off your, your time at work because you've got so many American Express cards to pay and Visa cards to pay and car bills to pay and the mortgage is too high and all you're doing is working for stuff instead of your stuff working for you. If you don't have savings, danger is coming. Take refuge. You better change something. You better act. If you don't have giving habits, you, you're all saver, and you don't have no giving habits. Listen, warning, danger is coming because you lack self-control. When you, don't tell your, when you don't tell your money, you're giving part of it away on purpose, 
You don't control your money. Your money controls you. Regardless of you're on the too much debt side or you're on the side of, not, uh, of saving too much. It can be dangerous either way. This process that we're talking about, taking refuge, it, it, it is a process. It is not just one thing. And here's the process. Action. It starts with action. These are in your notes. You, you are going to have to do something. Pray? Okay, certainly. But, but you can pray and let all the options pass you by because you're waiting to hear from the Lord when the Lord has probably been pretty clear with you. You just don't want to take the action that He's calling you to. So you want to be spiritual, of course, and keep praying until you get an option that you think you can live with better. That's not an option, is it? God wants you to obey. You know, when you have children, I, I, uh, since he's watching, I, I'll, I'll, he'll, he'll know this, so remember this. And my kids, we taught them what the definition of obedience was. Would you like to hear it? Without delay, without challenge, without excuse. Anything short of without delay, without challenge, or without excuse, anything short of that is disobedience. And it made everything so clear in our, in our life, in our house. In your spiritual relationship, it's the same way. When you know what God wants and you continue to pray about it, guess what? It's disobedience. Without delay, without challenge, without excuse. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to take some actions. You see the danger coming. You keep going. That makes you either naive or foolish. Simple at best, but not prudent, not smart, not wise. To refuse to act is to guarantee disaster. To wait until trouble arrives makes your actions meaningless. They limit your options. And you know this, don't you? You've had those things happen to you in the past. Every single day you delay, your options become fewer and fewer and fewer. The, the second part of this process after action is sacrifice. You realize you need to do something. You realize that you're going to have to give something up or you're going to have to give a relationship up or, or you're going to sacrifice a little bit of your reputation by getting an accountability partner or, or you're going to have to give something up because it's a, and it's a resource and you're going to have to sacrifice that. If you're a spender, you're going to have to save and that means you're going to have to eat dinner out or you're going to have to scale back on Christmas or, or whatever the case is and that's going to be a sacrifice and it's going to be painful. He's right, but if I end that relationship, it's going to be so complicated. She'll be so hurt. He'll be so hurt. It's going to be a sacrifice. In fact, beyond that, it might even be embarrassing. There might even be embarrassment and probably will be some embarrassment in this situation because you're taking action not on what is at the moment if you're prudent you just see how the dots are being connected going forward you are taking action on what will be in the future and maybe nobody else around you sees it they don't sense what's coming you do in most cases you will not be understood and you won't have an opportunity maybe to explain yourself People might even think you're a little fanatical or that you're overreacting. Why won't you ride in a car with her to, the, to, to, to wherever that is? And you don't explain yourself. Like, he's just a, 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 a kind of a, one of those religious people. You might even get poked at fun at, at work. <clears throat> but here's where the, where the process ends. Relief. Relief. What you gain by being prepared for the future will turn your sacrifice, get this, into an investment. It'll be an investment in your future. There are no regrets for those who read the warnings and, take and act appropriately. Even as you look at the scripture and you're the guy that steps out of the path and you have a season of your life where you're not making progress, but you're watching the danger just walk on by you and then you can get back on the path. You've lost a season of your life. You've lost a week of your life. You've lost a month of savings. But what you've gained is not the setback that that would have cost you had it hit you and blindsided you. It's usually easier, and I'll just share this with you, it's usually easier just to keep going. 
I mean, who, who wants to take action when you don't have to? Who, who wants to, take, you know, to sacrifice anything? Who, who wants to have an embarrassing moment and not really be able to explain why he or she is doing something? Who wants to do all of that when you can just do nothing? But when you do, you're going to suffer harm for it. That's what the Bible tells us. The wisest man who ever lived actually wrote that down. The simple suffer harm. Take out your, your if you haven't already, take out your, your sermon notes today. We have a special treat for you today. On the front of the sermon notes with, with some sticky stuff is you can just peel it off. It's one of those things you can just peel off. And that's a, pra- a card with a prayer on the back of it. And I'm giving you that. If you put it in your purse or your wallet, you'll probably never see it again. But, <laughs> but you know, keep this on your, your mirror. Keep it somewhere close. And that's a prayer you pray. And listen, this prayer is on my prayer list. I pray this every day. I pray this every day. It's a, I have a little prayer journal, and I, I read through that, and I have certain requests and things I pray about all the time. And this is, Lord, help me. Lord, help my wife. Lord, help my children see trouble long before it gets here. Oh, God, please help us see it coming. And then, God, give us the, cur- the wisdom to know what to do. And give us the courage to do it. Because you need both, don't you? You need foresight. You need to be able to connect those dots. But then you've got to have the wisdom to know what to do. And you've got to have the courage to step out in faith, even if you're misunderstood, even if it's a sacrifice, even if it's an embarrassment. You have to have the courage to take action before the options are too limited, before the, the, the situation is too late. There have been three major events in my marriage when we took action that absolutely made no sense to anyone around us. Leaving a church, many, several things. We, we, we couldn't explain it to people around us. It, you know, God, what are you doing with this? In two cases, we jeopardized relationships close to us that we were so sad about. In another It was a huge, huge, huge financial loss in a business. So we just had to close and people were going, what are you doing? Both sets of our parents thought we were crazy on one of these situations. Those were defining moments for Kim and I. Defining moments. In one case, I had to take responsibility for a decision that I could give no reason whatsoever for because it was to avoid something that hadn't happened yet. And people thought I was a little loony. It was a little bit of a sacrifice because of that. It was a little embarrassing maybe. Why are you doing that? One of the best stories in the entire Bible to to give you to illustrate this is 4,245 years ago. Yes, I did the math. Give or take a year here or there, right? A man named Noah gathered his three sons, Sham, Ham and Japheth. And he had a family meeting and he announced at this family meeting that we're going to build a really big boat. In fact, this boat is, 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 is going to be 450 foot long. Wouldn't be bad if this was a weekend project, but that was no weekend project. It's 450 feet long, it's 75 feet wide, and it's 45 feet high. That's four, four and a half stories tall and one and a half football fields long. That is a big boat. There were only eight of them. It took them 120 years approximately to build. There were no power tools. There was no DeWalt anything. There, were, there was no, no compressor, a nail gun. There, there was no power saw. There was, it was all hand tools. Elephants, maybe some beast helping them lift things. It was crazy. It took them a long, long time. Noah and his family looked like the biggest fools on the planet. They spent a lot of time. They spent a lot of money. In fact, you might say their entire family nest egg on this silly project. They spent basically a huge season of their life. And they blew their entire reputation. They were the laughing stock 
of the world. Then one day God said, get in. And if you read the Bible really carefully, maybe you never noticed this before, but then it said, God shut them in. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. Don't you think Noah was probably praying on the deck going, come on, Lord, (laughs) there's not even a cloud in the sky today or tomorrow or the day after. Where is the seven-day forecast anyway? No rain for seven days. And then one day, the foolish, fullest, fool, biggest fool in the world. Sorry, Janet. <laughs> the biggest fool in the world seemed like the wisest man ever to live. And why? Because Noah saw what was coming. And he had the courage to prepare for it. And 4,365 years ago, give or take, the flood began. You can read all about it in Genesis 6 and 7 and 8. Probably the biggest problem with this is we've got to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves. Where do you see trouble coming relationally? What are you going to do about it? Where do you see trouble coming financially? And what are you going to do about it? Pray? I bet you in those circumstances, God's already given you the warning signs. I bet you in most of those cases, you already know what God wants you to do. Even if you're not that big of a Bible reader, you probably know. Take refuge. That's the instruction that the Bible gives you. The wisest man on earth gives you this instruction. Take refuge. Do something extreme. Build an ark if you have to. Break up if you have to. Quit if you must. Fire him. Change your phone number. Move. Sell your house. Get rid of the internet if you must. Cut up the credit cards. See a counselor. Whatever that crazy thing is that you know you should do, but you just don't want to because of the sacrifice, because of the possible embarrassment, do it anyway. Because you'll suffer a whole lot less harm if you're prudent. See the danger and take refuge. There is a point at which you will not have any good option. Act now. And I want to challenge you to begin praying. Father, pray this right with me. Father, help me see trouble. Help me and my spouse, help my family to see trouble long, long, long before it gets here. And God, we need wisdom. Give us the wisdom when we see the trouble coming. Give me wisdom to know what to do. And Father, in the name of Jesus, give me the courage to do it. And you can freely confess, God, sometimes that's the hardest thing, is the action. I see it. I know what I should do. God, I desperately need the courage to act. Father, we need you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would infuse that into our life that you would shape us and mold us and make us more and more and more like Jesus in this area. Father, we need you. We need your insight. We need your wisdom. We need your courage. And Lord, I want to just for, for just a second, in our prayer time, every heaven battle, I, I want you to, I, I, God, I just want you to speak to us by your spirit. If anyone's on the wrong path spiritually, Lord, they don't know for sure if they died today that the spiritual path they're on would take them to heaven. They don't know where that ends. They hope, God, they're on the right path, but this is not a path you want to hope down. God, I I pray that you would help them read 1 John 5, 13 that tells them that these things have been written that you may know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life, that that, the most important question you will ever answer in your life, can be certain. We broke the law. We've lied, we've stolen God, we've committed adultery in our heart, we've not kept the Sabbath day, we've not 
always honored our parents, Lord. The fifth commandment, we've broken them all, God, if we're honest with ourselves. And there's five more where those came from if we're unsure about those. And the penalty for sin is death. God loves us. He doesn't want to punish us, but God is just and must see that every sin gets punished. And God, you loved us so much. Make this truth known to us today. God, you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever believeth in him should not perish in their sin, but have everlasting life. Because we broke the law and Jesus loved us so much that he paid the fine for us. He died on the cross. The penalty is death. He paid the death penalty for our sins. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you will, if you will put that in your life, you will have life. Read your Bible every day. Do what it says. God, give us understanding from the Holy Spirit and help us walk in truth. And if there's someone today that didn't know that for sure, would you speak into their life and let them connect those dots spiritually and know the path they're on is the right one. Lord, we praise you today and we worship you and we're so grateful for your word. Illuminate our hearts with it in Jesus' name. Amen.